right, uh, I'm Anders Halkren. I'm going to give a talk uh, called Don't Bore Your Course. And what that means is that, uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit ha about hardware. And uh, as Java programmers, uh, a lot of the time we don't think about hardware and actually don't want to think about hardware because, uh, well, we're programming in a high level language on, on a, a virtual machine on top of the hardware, right? So well, why should we care about the hardware? Well, most, most of the time, maybe we don't. Maybe we should spend uh, our efforts on understanding our algorithms and uh, trying to improve those and so on. But sometimes, uh, when you're uh, out to get performance, it's uh, important to understand what the hardware is actually doing so you can avoid uh, problems and uh, also try to make the most out of it. So I'm going to do a lot of examples here, very small uh, examples. And if you look at this, we just take an, an array and we sum it up using the stream API. And now, this, you just shouldn't think about this as, oh, this is supposed to be a, a hot uh, part of our code and we're trying to optimize it. That's not what I'm trying to do with these examples. It's more like I'm trying to use very tiny examples to illustrate some property of the hardware just to explain how the hardware works. So it's not, if, if you have a hot code that looks like this, you should definitely not try to fix it by introducing a parallel. You should think, why am I doing all of this summing, right? But what would you expect here? If you didn't know anything about the hardware, except possibly that we have multiple cores, so for example, this machine I'm running on here, that is a, a quad core machine and it has happy threading. So uh, if you ask uh, Java runtime how many available processes do I have, then it will say eight. And whether you really believe that or you think that, well, it's four with hyperthreading, that, that's, uh, that's another issue. Uh, but you would expect, in this case, somewhere between four and eight, at least, for the speed up when you put in parallel. And uh, if you were to run this on a, some nice Xeon server machine uh, with 40-something uh, virtual CPUs, you would probably expect to get something uh, 20, 30 at least speed up. In this case, actually, you would probably expect to get uh, the hyperthreads working because it's uh, so simple, so it, it, they should work. But that's not at all what you get in, in, in real life. So in real life, uh, on this machine, you would get the speed up of about 1.9 times. And when I ran this on a Xeon, and I, uh, 48 hyperthreads, but we gave it 40 CP, virtual CPUs because we got strange results when trying to max out over 48, then you get rather variable results, but they are somewhere in the range between 5 and 8. And so high variance, I don't really want to say that it's 6. Um, and why is this? Why is, why is there such a big difference? Well, the problem here in this case is that you're not getting the data into the CPU. So uh, the, the core i7 has two uh, channels between memory and, and, uh, and the core, and you're maxing them out, so you're getting a little less than two. Uh, and the Xeon has uh, eight, uh, which, so you can get a maximum of eight if you're running in what's called performance mode. If you're running in a safer mode, uh, um, that's lockstep, then you will only get half that, so you get a maximum of, of four. So that's an example of where things, if you didn't know about the hardware, then, then you would uh, maybe not expect this uh, result. So if I do another example here, this is uh, even more silly um, than the previous. Well, actually, it's a little bit more useful in, in some way. It's computing something. So if we're just thinking that, oh, okay, what is this doing? It's looping in an array, and uh, what is it doing for each iteration of the loop? Yeah, well, it's accessing uh, one element of the array, it's performing one multiplication, it's performing one addition. And then if you just switch which, uh, the order of the multiplication and, and the addition, you go like, well, it's the same operation, it's just different order, it should take the same amount of time, right? Well, no, it doesn't. Um, so on this, uh, well, any uh, x86-64 uh, uh, will 
B be about a factor of three faster than A. And I'm not going to tell you why yet, because I'm going to return to this in a moment. You can think about it in the meantime. Maybe you think it's obvious. So instead, I'm going to, to a third one that's maybe a little more subtle. So uh, again, a little bit silly. We're doing an, uh, a call to er erase binary search, but we're taking the, the one of the least useful ones, the one with integer array. And then we're feeding it a lot of integer keys. And then we we're trying to see, OK, how, how fast can we do this, this search? And what we're going to vary between the two runs is the size of the array. So either we take an exact power of two, or we take something that's a little bit larger. So we add just a little bit at the end. So, well, theoretically, uh, if you're going with a computer science model of, of this, uh, A should be faster but it should be very, very slightly faster, something like 0.05% or something like that, uh, which is much, uh, you can't measure that in Java because you have way too much uh, um, things going on in the machine. You're getting much higher variance from other factors. So no way you can measure that. So, same speed, right? Well, actually, B is faster. Uh, in, on this machine, it's about 1.4 times faster. And again, I'm not going to spill the beans just yet. I'm going to keep you in suspense. Or you can try to figure it out for yourself. All right, before I dive deeper into to what is going on inside the core, I'm going to say a little bit something about why it's going on in the core. So they keep telling me that it's a multi-core world. And sure, uh, if you look at, the, for example, a C on um, Broadwell, uh, from last year, 22 cores, that's, uh, that's many, right? But uh, what's striking is that they are so big. They are th over 300 million transistors in a core. Uh, and if you have followed this for a number of years, you think, oh, that's a lot of transistors. Why are there so many transistors there? And, and if you compare to uh, uh, something that uh, UC Davis um, did also last year, they built a 1,000 core uh, die, actually. And uh, that one has only 0 0.6 million transistors per, uh, per core. Uh, the whole thing with a 1,000 cores is, is uh, less, than, uh, two uh, less than the equivalent of two cores of this, this Xeon chip. And they're using a process that Intel started using uh, seven years ago. So clearly, they are not uh, doing uh, more advanced technology. They're just using the transistors in a different way. So, sure, we're getting more cores, but we're also having a lot of power inside each core. So that seems to be the priority. So clearly, if we're going to make the most out of hardware, we have to try to figure out what are these transistors used for and how can we make sure we, we really don't just waste them. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, basically, when I say waste them, then I'm um, talking about the title of the talk. They're bored. They're working. They seem to be at 100% utilization, but they're really not doing as much useful work as they could. So uh, for example, the first one with the memory uh, transfer rate, they're basically sitting around waiting for memory to deliver data for them. I'm sure you were also bored when you were waiting for co-workers to, to uh, do something and you were just sitting there and, come on, or waiting for the computer, maybe. And then you start surfing and, yeah, well, you know. Okay, so let's get back to the second example here. The one where we had a multiplication and we had an addition and we swapped the order and we got a big difference in, in performance. Well, the key uh, thing here first is that CPU can execute more than one instruction in parallel. That's what a lot of these transistors are used for. They are uh, executing, they, they, we're giving the assembly instructions in a certain order, but they go like, hey, I can do this, and I can do this, and I can do this, and start doing things in, in all sorts of order, and then they sort of uh, put it all together at the end. Well, there is one obvious limitation here, is that you can't start to compute something until you have your inputs, right? That's, uh, 
kind of the obvious, uh, and that's what the illustration here is. It's the handoff of the baton. It's, uh, you have to get some input to work with. So you have, a lot of the time you have to wait for some sort of handoff. If this was all that was going on, it was just the hardware uh, thing, then actually A would be faster than B, because A can start the multiplication and uh, the fetch from the array element uh, in parallel, and then they would merge the result with, with the addition. Whereas B has to first get the, the, the input to the multiplication, so it has to get uh, the uh, array element, and once it has that, then it can start the multiplication. However, the JVM comes in here, and it's going to unroll this loop. Uh, if we run it exactly as it was on the slide, uh, then I'm getting that it unrolls it eight times. If I change it from int, uh, using int, to int, uh, using longs, then for some reason it decides that four times is better, better unrolling. So it, it's a little bit uh, up to uh, decisions of, of the JVM, and of course, which JVM you're, uh, you're running, I'm assuming Oracle here. Um, so what happens then if you unroll a few times? Well, the first one, you, uh, you, then you're dependent, the multiplication is dependent on the previous value of R, right? So you're go, going to basically do a multiply, then you're going to do an add, multiply, add. You, you get rid of, uh, of the loads from the array, because those, except for the beginning of the very first one, uh, you can parallelize away. Uh, in the second case, uh, the, the handoff is just for a plus. Uh, addition is very cheap operation. So in, in there it's instead going to be like, okay, you're going to do the uh, load from the array, you're going to do the, the multiply, and then if you're doing more than four unrolling, you, you're going to have a little bit of um, time getting the results out. Uh, it's like that old joke. Um, if it takes three minutes to boil an egg, uh, how many minutes does it take to boil four eggs? Well, it takes three minutes. But if you're boiling eight eggs, in case of multiply, it's actually going, uh, well, what did I say, four minutes, Th three minutes. Uh, if you're boiling uh, eight eggs, then it's going to take four minutes uh, in CPU logic. So it's a, a little bit uh, different. And then you also have the, the overhead of the loop in both cases. So, but basically, if it's eight-way, it's going to be 4.3 cycles for A and 1.4 for B. If you only unroll it four-way, then it's going to be uh, about a factor two instead. All right, but... Okay, this is very interesting and all, but how does this really help you? It's not like you can take A and you can just... Uh, switch the orders so you get B, because it computes the wrong thing, right? So you're kind of stuck with your algorithm. Well, it's good for two things. Uh, mostly, I would say, it's, it's that when you sh have a design choice, you can look at the, the code and say that, oh, this is probably going to run much faster than I expect. It looks more expensive, but it's actually uh, cheap. Uh, typically, you have some bit operations or, or something that uh, decoding some, some data that can run extremely fast. But sometimes you can actually transform uh, your, your code as well. Uh, so that's also kind of an unrolling, but a little bit different than the JVM does it. So I'm going to give an example of that. I'm not uh, suggesting you do this uh, on this particular code. This is an example. Uh, so we're taking the hash code uh, method from uh, Java Util Arrays, where we go around, uh, we go through the uh, <coughs> array and multiply the accumulated result with 31, and then we add element. So this is kind of similar to our our example um, uh, A from before, but there's a little bit of a twist, and that's this factor of 31. That's not uh, something they just pulled out of a hat. I mean, sure, it's a prime number, but they didn't pick uh, 29, they didn't pick uh, 37. And the reason that they picked 31 specifically is because uh, that's easy to optimize. So uh, you can replace and multiply with 31 with a shift and a subtract. 
Now, on an x86, uh, multiply is kind of a fast instruction, so you don't gain that much, gain about 1.3 times on this example, compared to if you would s swap in uh, like 29 instead of 31. Uh, but on some uh, uh, CPUs, especially uh, ones that were common when Java was young, uh, then a multiply can be a very expensive operation, so this optimization would do much more. But since on an x86, it doesn't do that much, this optimization, we're going to trade it in and try to replace it, uh, sacrifice that in hopes of getting more uh, parallelism uh, from the CPU instead. So if we decide we're going to do this in eight times um, unrolling, then we simply see what would be compute from eight iterations and then yeah, break it up like this, painful as it is. And then, of course, we're going to multiply all these factors of 31 through. And then we end up with something like this. Uh, of course, always when you do unrolling, uh, you have to sort of handle the case where uh, the loop doesn't have the correct number of iterations. So you have to, if it's not an even multiple of eight, you have to, to fix it at the, the end. Uh, and this is one reason you shouldn't unroll yourself unless you have to, because the JVM can do this more efficiently than you do with some uh, nice assembly uh, go-tos, basically, uh, branches. Uh, so that's one. And the other one is we're going to, when we raise 31 to a power of 6 or 7, we're going to overflow 32-bit uh, uh, int. But that doesn't matter here, because we're only going to use the lower 32 bits anyway, so we can just uh, truncate at 32 bits. These are these hex numbers here. Uh, I use hex numbers because uh, uh, using negative numbers here, is just, it just feels wrong. So this gets us to about 1.9 times faster. And it's simply because we can do a lot of these multiplications in. Uh, parallel. Okay, now most of you and me too for that matter probably don't execute a lot of code with multiplications all over the place. What we're actually doing is we're following references between objects. And that's a little bit of bad news um, because here following the reference is actually the handoff of the baton. It's very difficult to do some parallelizing when you're basically going from one, one object to the next. So here is an array list, and then it ha that has uh, an internal uh, array of objects containing the elements, and then uh, each element points to some string object, which in turn has an internal array of characters. And the string and character array is what I especially wanted to remember from this slide, because we're going to, to revisit those uh, a bit in the next example. Here. So, another problem, except for this baton thing, is that it really matters to us where these objects end up on the Java heap, which is something we have no control over. So, let's look at uh, a little bit of an example here. Uh, I just creating a, a, an array of string by reading it in from, from a file um, with the Java uh, 8 uh, style way of doing it. So that's something that happens, and then we're doing some other things, causing some GCs and whatnot, and then uh, uh, some, at some further point, again, a rather silly example, but a little bit more realistic this time. This is basically some sort of query, right? So we're, we're asking how many of these uh, these uh, strings end with a question mark. Of course, we can parameterize it with a lambda and whatnot, but uh, that's not the point here. Uh, so it's important to note that we have no guarantees about where these uh, string objects are going to be. But in practice, they are going to be allocated the first string object its internal character array, next string object, its uh, internal character array, and so on, until, uh, until we run out of uh, space in our uh, TLab. And then uh, it's going to move the TLab. Then uh, when you start running out of, uh, of Eden, it's going to start a garbage collection, and it's going to 
scatter things. And how exactly does that depend a lot on what GC you're running, what else is going on in the machine, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is by no means any guarantees of, uh, or saying that, oh, this is how it works. But I, I did an uh, empirical study on this exa uh, precise example with some uh, very short-lived objects just to, to get, uh, get the uh, uh, data to move to, uh, move, to, move to old regions in, in uh, G1, GC in this case. Uh, and then I ended up with around 15 on average quite a big variance, uh, average strings in a row. And 15 doesn't sound much, but it's enough to get a decent performance, so we don't really have a problem here. But now I'm going to create a problem. I'm going to throw in a sort. Now, this doesn't really have any effect on the algorithms, uh, because we're just going through all of the, the uh, strings anyway. It doesn't matter which order they are in. But this is going to completely destroy these 15 in a row. Not because we're moving the strings, uh, but because we're moving the reference in, in, in the array. So they are going to be visited in basically random order, assuming this uh, file is random, which it is in this case. So we're going to get a slowdown, which is quite dramatic here. It's four times slower. Ooh. Oops. Actually, I can do it wor can do worse than that because it's going to, even if I destroy the order, it's still going to be the case that the string object and its internal character array are going to end up uh, after each other almost all of the time uh, with almost any GC. Um, so if I destroy that by simply creating new string objects to wrap the, uh, the character array, I have actually no idea why they even have a constructor like this, but they do. Uh, then I completely shatter all uh, memory location issues and I get up to seven times slower. Woohoo! Great. Just what we wanted, right? Okay, so clearly this is something we should maybe look into a little more uh, closer and learn something about, right? But doing it this way with tricking the GC to do bad stuff for us and so on, it seems a little bit uh, uh, difficult to work with. So instead of doing it that way, uh, let's uh, switch these locations to ints. Uh, for the simple purpose to see what happens when we throw in different things uh, to the benchmark. And I'm using ints because uh, assuming you have a moderate sized heap, uh, 30 gigs or less, and you're running on an Oracle uh, JVM, then uh, the object references are going to be represented at 32-bit uh, values. If you're running on bigger heaps than that, uh, you would probably want to switch in longs here for the, in, in the test instead. But I'm going to run with ints. So this uh, example simply um, picks up an integer from the array, uh, looks at, oh, it's a reference to some other point in the array, going to jump there and going to jump around uh, the array, basically. So by varying uh, how the array, its size and its uh, composition, I, I can simulate different uh, hostile or friendly uh, situations. Uh, so this is the hostile one. We're jumping around in a very mean way. Uh, I say random, it's not quite random because I'm actually a little bit meaner than random. But then we can get it as slow as around 130 seconds uh, for a billion iterations on this machine. Uh, something very similar when I rent on Xeon. If you run it on a desktop uh, uh, version of a, um, i7, then it's going to be a little bit faster. Or at least was on my, my machine. So. Uh, first of all, we can note that there's a whole lot of uh, computational cycles, uh, clock cycles here. It's 140 clock cycles or thereabouts. That's a lot. But even more interesting, and, uh, I, I knew memory was slow, but until I thought about it this way, it didn't really hit me how bad it really is. So if you uh, instead think about it as bandwidth, what's the effective bandwidth for doing it, it like this? 
Well, it's only 30 megabytes per second. I mean, you probably want to double check my results and double check the computation. It's that, uh, this is to me, it, first time I came across it, it's, it's quite a shock. It's 20 times slower than a SSD, even if the SSD is uh, SATA 3 connected. Of course, that's not fair because the SSD is reading sequentially and we're jumping around like idiots, but uh, still, it uh, gives you some perspective about just how slow memory is. Of course, uh, it's not like the hardware boys don't know about this. Uh, they're just trying to hide it from you. Uh, and the way they're trying to, or that's the nasty way of putting it, a friendlier way is they're trying to help you cope with this problem. So what they are doing is they are investing a lot of these transistors we talked about uh, before into cache. So if we look at what happens when we size down the array, then the cache comes into play. Um, caches, I should say. And then for a, uh, an array that's small enough to fit into L1, uh, then we get to around four cycles. L2, around nine cycles. L3 is a little more jitter here, but uh, at this point of a thousand, it's about 31. And then for some reason, it starts going up before it hits L3 which it really shouldn't, but that just proves that these are real measurements and not something I affect. Uh, probably there's something else going on in the machine and, uh, and it's destroying, uh, well, simply competing for the cache. Uh, because L3 is a, a shared resource among, among the course. And I also can't quite explain why there's one dot there that's much faster than the others. But again, weird things happen. But as you can see, it's quite a dramatic difference between when we can run in L1 or when we hit main memory with a few intermediary stages. Uh, okay, so there are a couple of more things uh, to say about the caches before I uh, move on. One important, I could illustrate this with, uh, I was going to illustrate this with graphs too, but they got rather boring, so I skipped it. Uh, the thing is that when you get data into the cache uh, from a main memory, you don't do it uh, one 64-bit uh, quantity at a time, for example. You're getting it in chunks called cache lines, which on an x86 is 64 bytes each. And the effect of this is that if you're doing several lookups into the same cache line, uh, all but the first are basically free. So uh, if you're, for example, looking at some object, looking at two fields, or looking at one field, uh, uh, quite close in, in performance. The other one, which is even more important, is that if you're accessing the memory in a sequential order, then the process is going to detect your, your pattern. Once you miss two consecutive cache lines, it's going to start bringing those cache lines into, uh, into L1 automatically. It's called prefetching. And that's really, really where you want to be because uh, then you basically get L1 performance across the whole memory. Of course, it only works if you're accessing memory sequentially. Still, we still have this handoff problem. So even if you're doing a sequential version of, of this uh, chase int, where we're always chasing the next consecutive int, it doesn't know you're going to chase the next consecutive int until it looks at it. So it's going to prefetch, but it can't parallelize. So if you want even faster performance than around four cycles per, uh, per lookup, then you need to, to do it in some way that so the processor can parallelize it. So if you compare with this uh, original stream something, that's around four times uh, faster than, than running this chase int, even on the most friendly of cases. Okay, so that's uh, the background uh, about the hardware. And then, I'm, uh, yeah, one, one more thing there. Uh, just people may think that, oh, what? Now it's gone too far, 64-bit cache line. I don't want to code this into my, my program. 
Well, you don't necessarily have to. Uh, there are uh, class of algorithms, uh, quite fun ones, called cache oblivious. Uh, they automatically adapt to the, to the caches without knowing anything about them. Or in practice, it's just get it somewhat right. That's better than, than getting it completely wrong, which you will if you just ignore it. Or do it sequentially. If you do it sequentially, it doesn't really matter. Um, that then all you have to know is that the processor is prefetching. OK. But this is all well and good. But um, how do you change how you code? Especially since, well, we don't really have any control over where these objects uh, lie. So here it's going to be a little bit more my experiences uh, rather than hard cold facts. Um, but there are some things that, that are sort of not in dispute, uh, like making sure that the fields that you're going to access uh, are in the class that actually accesses them. So you move around your fields. This is usually going to get you make your code neater anyway, so just see it as an extra bonus from that. And another thing is that it's something we tend to do as object-oriented programmers. We start by constructing some nice class. We draw class diagrams or whatever, and uh, then we write code to fit this, this data model afterwards. But I think uh, you usually get much nicer and certainly faster code if you sort of iterate it. So you, uh, you, you write some code and then you think, oh, OK, wouldn't it be better if the class looked like this instead? And you do a little bit of tweaking and then you harmonize them together. Another thing uh, is that when you break down some, some if statement or, or such, it's very, quite natural that you do it by first uh, doing the very strange special cases, get rid of them, and sort of the same way you, you go down when you construct a class hierarchy. Then you tend to, to get a structure like that. Uh, but if you want to hit performance uh, things, then you should try to think about the most common, useful uh, center case first. So you get the, the straightest line through the, the code is what's called a happy path. Uh, this in itself don't get you uh, happy, uh, but uh, it fits in well with other ideas like this, harmonizing data and code together, and a couple of things I'm going to hit on in a moment. But here's the bad news. If you're really, really going to go for uh, extreme performance when it comes to uh, cache things, then you're going to have to do some ugly, low-level, time-consuming, uh, ugly... Uh, uh, well, there are some hope. Uh, there's something called the Object Layout Project, where they're trying to give you some control over this. And, of course, there's uh, this Project Valhalla that's been running for years and years about getting to your value types into into Java, but that's uh, at least Java 10, probably not. <laughs> I don't think they're going to have it for Java 10, actually. Uh, but before I go on and show you just how painful this uh, pain is, uh, then I'm going to uh, show you a quote from Knut. This is very common that you get this thrown into your face, the middle part of it, the, about the root of all evil thing. That's not the one I'm interested in. Obviously, he was wrong about that, but it was written in, in 1974, and that was before frameworks were common. So, um, uh, but what I think is interesting here is the 97 and 3. Because uh, a lot of people talk about some 80-20 rule or some 90-10 rule, when, when, when you're supposedly executing 80% of your time in 20% of your code? Well, if that's the case, then just forget this. It's going to take you way, way too long, and uh, it can't possibly pay unless, uh, unless you have a very small code, code base running on, on thousands of data centers. Then maybe somebody would pay you to do this. Uh, but you know, most of us aren't in that space. Uh, 
So I actually have a bit of a solution for, for that if you feel that you're tending towards 80-20. Uh, from personal experience, uh, a previous generation of the product I'm working on, which is a, a non-relational uh, database, uh, there we had worked hard on optimizing things and it was kind of like you, you weren't getting anywhere. It was kind of t little time here, little time there. And the new generation uh, tried to design this uh, 97.3 in from the beginning. And that worked out quite well. So I'm going to cover that uh, towards the end here. But this is the main tool for uh, doing this today before, before value types or anything like that. So instead of using a, uh, an array of some small uh, class, like a point is a traditional example. I don't think it's very good, but most have seen it, so I'm giving it here anyway. Uh, where you have either you, you put the x's into one array and, uh, oh, it's supposed to say y's there. I changed it to green uh, this morning and I guess I forgot uh, got a copy paste error. Uh, or you can put them into the same point uh, array and uh, uh, and uh, doing every other x and every other y, or you can pack them to longs or whatever. Okay, so this is not very much fun. I've done this on a lot of classes, uh, and it's, uh, well, not that many, but uh, I've done it a number of times anyway. Uh, but it's not that painful uh, because of this 3%. Remember this, just the 3%. Uh, but if you want to do other things than just getters and setters, then things start to get a bit painful. Uh, I don't know why you would want to sort points specifically, but other things you might want to sort, you might want to hash, you might want not only have ints in there, maybe you have some strings or something. Uh, it's not, not, not that great. It can be a little bit better if you do some compromising. So you can actually go back and forth between um, uh, two representations, one of the, uh, the primitive one we had there, and one that we actually have arrays of objects. So it could either be that you translate it to, to an actual array of actual points, or for things like, especially for things like sorting and hashing, you can have some uh, inner class, uh, which just has an index, but uh, since it's, uh, a class, you can, you can put some hash code and equals in there, and you can use uh, hash maps and, and sorting and whatnot. But the point is that then you get a bit of a break on, on, on uh, the things that are not that important to you. Sorting maybe you don't do that often, it's maybe during construction, something like that. Uh, and uh, then uh, on the, the ones that where you really, really want the performance, then, then you put in the extra extra work. And uh, as we've seen, these board processors, they have a lot of uh, extra resources uh, that you can spend on, on conversion. And also it's, it's cash friendly, so that's why it's not so expensive as it seems, because we're doing prefetches when we go from the array, and uh, we're uh, going to size these, not, these arrays not too big, so we can get them into L1 or at least L2 when we uh, convert them. Uh, and if you do the very worst thing I can think of, which is strings, uh, and you run this on this location, location, location example, it, this conversion thing uh, only slows down that, that simple uh, question mark search with uh, about 1.4 uh, compared to the, the four times and seven times that we were. So, so it's not that expensive, uh, and especially if you only do it uh, on the less important things. Uh, and then another thing, which is nice, is uh, playing around with bits. Uh, I like to do that just because it's fun, but I'm talking more about the boring things. When you try to, instead of having several fields, you're trying to pack them into a long. Because the processor can do a lot of bit operations in parallel, uh, splitting it up and packing it down is almost, uh, almost for free, and then you reduce the, you can use your caches better because uh, things are simply smaller, uh, and uh, memory transfer rates and so on, it helps. 
and uh, Bitset. I, I like Bitset. Actually, uh, I have a couple of versions of it myself, I usually use, but um, people don't seem to choose it. I think that's a shame. I think there's a lot of lot of places where you can where you can apply this. So I think you could take a look and see if you can find them yourself. Um, then you can get some hints about uh, what to do from, from the complexity of the algorithm. So if you're doing something that's linear, then it's obvious it's prefetching. If it's slower than linear, then you can do, uh, uh, still do prefetching, but then you also want to split data into cache-sized blocks, which often can happen automatically if you have a divide and conquer type algorithm. So merge sort and quick sort perform quite well when it comes to cache, whereas heap sort, for example, is terrible. And if it's sublinear, then basically all you can do is try to use cache lines as efficiently as possible. So you want uh, maybe not a binary tree, maybe you want to have a, a branch that's a little bit wider. And if you're doing uh, hashing, most don't do hashing themselves, but if you do, uh, then you will probably want uh, to put keys and values uh, alternating into an array, and you want to do linear probing. You don't want a lot of links leaving the hash table uh, for, uh, for caching reasons. Uh, okay, I'm slow, of course, <laughs> but um, if I do a quick thing about binary uh, search, um, uh, we talked about that in the beginning, so I have to give you the answer. There, when we do binary search, we always start by visiting the center node. And then we will either visit the one-quarter node or the three-quarter node, and so forth. Meaning, the top of the trees should fit quite nicely into a, to a cache, because there are not many nodes at the top. But one problem is that if uh, this happens to be a power of two, then all of these uh, top nodes are all going to have a lot of uh, zeros uh, at the end of the index in, in binary. And the way the caches work, these are going to try to fit into the same position in the cache. So the cache uh, is basically a hash table with a poor hash function. So you're going to get what's called as conflict misses. Um, but it's not so bad on Intel because uh, you have something called eight-way associativity. So it can handle a lot of collisions. Uh, and AMD, for example, would do worse here. Uh, and the other thing that's bad here is that only one single element, there's only one int in each cache line that, that's really used. The bottom of the tree behaves in a very nice uh, way uh, because they're, uh, all, all the things are put in consecutive locations, so that there you have optimal cache line behavior. And I did an example uh, where I replaced binary search with a small utility class that had a 16-way branch, but I'm going to skip that one because uh, it was a little faster, but uh, I'm too slow today. Uh, this one, the string-free zone, is also a little bit uh, extreme. I use it in, in the database to a great uh, effect, but it's a little bit exotic, so I skip that one too. Instead, if you look at the typical optimization cycle, then you will profile your program on some important use case. Uh, execution profiler, maybe it's a memory profiler, maybe it's... A, uh, well, it doesn't matter. You're doing some kind of profiling. You find the bottleneck, you handle the bottleneck and you repeat until you run out of money or until everything is good or most likely until it's just too painful to continue because not getting that much benefit anymore. And I find that this is, uh, works great if you have some real performance problem like a bug, uh, you have some n square behavior, you have some uh, logging happening, you have some database uh, craziness, uh, something like that. But when you're doing pure improving the performance, then there are two problems. One is uh, that it's hill climbing. So you're trying to get to a higher place from where you are, but maybe you have to take a somewhat different approach to reach the real top. And then again, it's this 90, 10, 80, 20 rule thing. And my solution for, for this 80, 20 problem is that before you start optimizing things in this traditional way, uh, 
uh, then you try to, to make the code more distilled, purer. So uh, you simply describe what is it that I really, really, really want to do, uh, as if you were explaining it to somebody else. You emit all the, the nasty details. And then once you have that description, then you compare it to the code and go like, oh, okay, can I do something to bring these closer together for the main case? Then you can move things out of the main case, put them in pre and post processing, for example. You can do some transformation between data structures, that sort of thing. And then the magic happens when you start reapplying these happy path and uh, data code harmony things. Because each time you do a cycle here, these two uh, steps are going to help each other. So if you repeat and refine this uh, a number of times, then uh, you're going to have a good chance of getting from, from uh, uh, this 80-20 type thing to this more critical 3%. And then you can probably have the energy to really, really focus on, on those parts that truly matter to you. Uh, okay, so if I'm going to sum this up, then uh, understanding the hardware, that's the, the first step. Then uh, I could say this at the beginning, but uh, of course you should ask yourself, how much can I do? How important is uh, performance for my application? How much am I willing to invest in, in this? If, if you want to go further, then it's like, oh, okay, which techniques of these uh, will apply? And you will have to modify them. I have invented uh, several of these for, uh, or adapted or invented them for, for my situation. You will have to do some adapting of your own. Uh, but uh, that's not easy. But, uh, you know, if it was easy, what would be the fun? It's the all about the challenge, right? So, any questions? Yes? Uh, how about early returns? Do they break the happy path? Early return? The happy path is um, mostly about trying to structure your code. So if you were trying to do the happy path, uh, you will maybe end up with an if statement that says if, and then you have some complicated condition that, that uh, gets rid of all of the, um, the, the other null exceptions. And then by sort of isolating it there, you can see that, oh, I really don't want to have a condition like this. And then you modify the data structure to fit. So it's not so much about the, the low level code flow. It's more of a think, thinking about it. More questions? Okay. Oh. Uh, it's no internet resource I invented this terminology myself. Well, basically what we do is we have a, a part of the database, in my case, uh, where remove all the strings that are in, in at least certain columns of the database and uh, code them as ints. So as soon as you're doing inserts to this part of the database, you have to, to get the strings, uh, look them up, convert them to the ints, create the database representation. Uh, now, this is not so bad if, if the, the strings are already present in the database, which is very common in our case. But sometimes, of course, it's going to be a new, uh, new entry in the, the database, and then you have to do some, some, some work to integrate, update that. Uh, doing that efficiently is a little bit tricky. And then uh, your work with the ints, uh, in uh, the case of the database, it's quite common that we have range uh, qu uh, queries, so you're going to have okay, I want everything in this uh, column of the database to be between this string and this string, and then it's quite convenient to be able to do it by testing against ints instead of doing comparison strings. And then when, once you have gotten your result back, which is uh, coded as ints, then you have to normalize it back to strings when you return it to the, to the caller. Uh, so it's not for everyone, uh, uh, but uh, we have found it to be very efficient for, for our use case. Okay. Is that it? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>